So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmad wa salli ala Rasulil Kareem, amma ba'd fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, inshallah, I'm going to talk fast and try to say as much as I can. Uh, there's a lot of information to that I want to cover. Um, to get an idea of everything I want to cover, uh, I will just go through the what I wrote down as uh, kind of like my notes. Um so here's kind of like my notes on what I want to cover. Uh, before we begin, so I want to talk about how this situation that we have currently will be taking us uh, to a, 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 from chaos to catastrophe in a sense, and in a way not. And so we'll discuss that. We're going to talk about the Quran and the Christian divide. And there's some very important information that I want to share regarding that. A religious order versus secular order, uh, talking a little bit about liberalism and how this war uh, is a threat to liberalism and uh, the neo-Nazi situation in Ukraine, the Donbas situation, the neutral status situation. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the Judeo-Christian eschatology. So you can kind of think of the first part of our conversation will be like looking at everything from floor level one, which is politics uh, in the world of cause and effect. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at this situation from the perspective of cause and effect. And then we're going to look at uh, that anyhow, uh, how does this link to number that now we're going to floor number two, which is uh, Christian and Jewish eschatology. We're going to look at both eschatologies today, and uh, and the reset, the Judeo-Christian eschatology, and so basically, and the occult. Okay, so the Shaitan and their role. So we're going to go to like floor number, you can say two, and then floor number three. So we're going to look at things at three different uh, levels, you can say, uh, on the ground. And after looking at things from the perspective of being on the ground, uh, then we're going to look at how things are in terms of the world of eschatology and how that relates to Quran, especially Christian eschatology and Jewish eschatology. And uh, then finally, we'll look at um, some other aspects that have to do with the Quran. So let me very quickly, inshallah ta'ala, uh, give us a introduction to this conversation using the Quran, okay? Uh, I want to share with you, first of all, if you please take a look at the surahs over here. You have Surah Isra, Surah Kahf, and Surah Maryam, okay? These three surahs, particularly Surah Isra and Surah Kahf, come together to make a pair. When you understand the pairing of these surahs, your understanding of the surahs will increase dramatically. So I'm going to show you that, but I want you to please take a look the Surah Al-Isra is primarily is also known as Surah Bani Israel. The primary topic of Surah Al-Isra is, or you can say that the, it's all around Bani Israel. Okay. Then you have Surah Al-Kahf. Then you have Surah Al-Maryam. Surah Al-Maryam is about what topic? Christianity. So between talking about the Jewish community and the Christian community is Surah Al-Kahf. Okay, so the Kahf is a you can say the the hinge between these two great surahs. Now, uh, let us look at uh, the Isra and the Kahf in terms of. Let me actually um, do a side by side comparison here for you, so you can have a better idea of some things that I'll be saying today, because this is going to be a part of what I want to show you today. Okay. If you look at Surah Al-Isra, okay, Surah Al-Isra, بعد عوض بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم starts with Subhanallah, and Surah Al-Kahf starts with Alhamdulillah. Surah Al-Isra then says, "Al Al Subhan Al Ladi Asra bi Abdihi," okay, the one who took his servant on a journey, okay, the Isra, and on the travel, and the. Surah Al-Kahf is talking about Al-Ladhi Anzala Ala Abdihi. So you see the similarity? 
the one who took up his servant, the one who brought down to his servant. And Abdihi, his servant, is used in both surahs. Okay, over there is over here is Alhamdulillah, Alladhi Anzala Ala Abdihi Al Kitab. The one, Alhamdulillah, all praise and thank God, Allah sent down this Quran and the guidance to Kahf on his servant, on his on his beloved, on his servant. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the book walam yaj'alahu iwaja and he placed no crookedness in this book compare this to subhana alladhi asra bi abdihi layla min al masjid al haram now we have subhanallah versus alhamdulillah alladhi alladhi asra bi abdihi versus anzala ala abdihi then over there you have this the Quran coming down to the heart of the Prophet. And over here, you have the mention of from Mecca to Jerusalem. Okay. The journey from Mecca to Jerusalem. Okay. Okay. Number one, you can see that uh, both surahs have a link because one is subhanAllah, the other alhamdulillah, and the rest I talked about. But the other very clear link between both surahs and this is just to give you, I, I could do like a whole uh, conversation just on the similarities and how the two surahs interlink, but I'm just giving you a hint here, okay? And so, because this would be, there are many, many ayahs that in Sutan Isra are also in Sutan Kahf. Many verses that are repeated in Sutan Kahf are repeated in a different way in Sutan Isra, okay? So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, Sutan uh, Sutul Bani Israel ends with three quls. Qul udullaha awidur rahman ayyama tad'uhu falahu al-asma'ul husna wa la tajhar bi salatika wa la tukhafit biha wa abtaghi bayna thalika sabila. First qul. Second. Qul aminu aw la tu'minu inna alladhina inna alladhina utul ilm min min qablihi idha tutla alayhim yukharruna li adhqani sujjada. Okay. Second pull, and the third is the last verse from the same topic Sutul Kahf starts. This is the same topic as Sutul Kahf in the very beginning. Alhamdulillah. And over there it starts with Subhanallah. Sutul Isra starts with Subhanallah, ends with Alhamdulillah. Then Sutul Kahf starts with Alhamdulillah. And ends with three quls. Sutul Isra ends with three quls. Sutul Kahf ends with three quls, as I'll show you in a second. قل الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا. Okay. So قل الحمد لله and the next surah starts with Alhamdulillah. Say Alhamdulillah and the next surah starts by saying Alhamdulillah. Now, uh, let me just show you. This is now uh, Kahf starting with Alhamdulillah and if you go down and I'm just showing you the you can say the the links between the surahs okay okay last ayah i'm a man just like you i'm not a uh, you know i'm not uh, a anything divine in that in that sense as they did to jesus because that's part of the topic that's being mentioned here in the very beginning and then okay Okay, say that the words of Allah are more than the oceans, and then uh, So three quls here, three quls here. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah. Ending with alhamdulillah, then alhamdulillah. And now, I only gave this to you as an introduction. Otherwise, there's more than 20, 30 ayat that have similarities with one another. Okay, I'm just giving you a hint over here. You can look at both the sources. I'll give you one more example that relates to our topic today in a sense, okay, that uh, will help uh, maybe make uh, some, you can say, let me give you one more. Oh, another link, uh, very, uh, the three questions the Jews asked. The Prophet Sallallahu they asked the Prophet three questions. One question is answered in Surah Al-Isra, two questions are answered in Surah Al-Kahf. Yes, Aluna ka ani ruh, O Prophet Sallallahu they ask you about the ruh, 
Okay. So they ask you about the ruh. That question is answered here. And the who is Zul Qarnain and who are the Ashab al Kahf is answered in Sul Kahf. Okay. So the three quls at the end. And subhanallah, alhamdulillah, the Quran coming down, the Prophet going up, ending with alhamdulillah, three quls in the boat at the at the end of the surah. And then answering the questions the Jews had in both the surahs. Okay. And uh, let me now show you this verse uh, of the Quran, inshallah. And remember, this is such a surah, uh, Surah Al-Bani Israel is so Jewish, you can say, that it has the entire Jewish history in it in the very beginning. And number two, it has the Ten Commandments in it. This surah has the Ten Commandments, the entire Ten Commandments, and the entire history in the beginning. Okay. Now, besides that, it has... Uh, let me show you, inshallah, if I. Give me one second. Okay. This topic in ayah number 58 of Sutul Bani Israel, Ba'da A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Al Rajim, Allah says, Wa imin qariyatin illa nahnu muhlikuha. There will be no city except we will destroy the city. Before the day of judgment, or we will severely punish it with a severe punishment. This is written and already inscribed, it's already done. This is part of human fate. Okay. This same situation is now in Sutil Kahf in what? Okay. That in the very beginning of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? To warn you of a severe military intervention. This Ba'san Shadid is also mentioned in the beginning of Sutul Bani Israel when Allah is talking about a military power. Let me show you. Uh, okay. Ba'san Shadid. When the first time your temple fell, meaning the Jews. We raised our servants against you, Uli Ba'sin Shadid, having severe military power. And they entered your houses. The same word is now used in Sutul Kahf, in the very beginning. This war that will be from Allah will be a very severe military intervention, a very severe military uh, war. Okay? And over here in the very beginning, this is one of the parts I want to focus on today. And those who say, and to warn those who say Allah has adopted a son. Warn those who say Allah has adopted a son. So first Allah tells us in Sutul Kahf there's going to be a war. And over here Allah says, to warn you, O Muslims, of a severe Warn a battle of a severe war to warn the Muslims of a severe battle, and then Allah says, And warn the Christians who say that Allah is three, that Allah has adopted a son. son. Meaning, if you add up the two, then this destruction will come in the hands of the Christian world largely, okay, it will be started or initiated by the Christian world. And that is what the Judeo-Christian alliance is. Uh, I was thinking that uh, when we say Judeo-Christian civilization, what it really means, okay, is a secular state that has only one goal, and that is to establish the state of Israel, okay? Because there's nothing in common about Jews and Christians. For the whole history, Jews have always blamed Christians uh, I mean, the Christians have always blamed the Jews. You killed their God. They killed Jesus, according to them. The, Jew, the Jews killed Jesus. So they never got along until now. Why? Because of the secular state. Why? Because that's the only way Jews and Christians. So this secular state leads to a liberal state, which leads to a godless state. And so this is the situation we find ourselves in. And so this Judeo-Christian civilization, and you have this alliance of a certain group of the Bani Israel and a certain group of the Christians that will then come together
to attack the Muslims. And so the Kahf is talking to the Muslims. This is what's going to happen to you. This is going to be your scenario. Study what you need to do. And Allah doesn't only tell us what they will do in Surah Al-Kahf, but also gives us the solutions in Surah Al-Kahf, which I don't have time to go into today. Obviously, that will be a conversation for another day. But over here, I'm only establishing I'm now what I want to establish, the main point I want to establish now that I have established a link between Surah Al-Kahf and Surah Bani Israel. I think I could go on and show more links. But I think I showed you enough links between the two surahs that anyone can understand that these two surahs are interlinked. By the way, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it very quickly again, because I have a lot of information to cover today. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy, inshallah. And that is that um, the surahs in the Quran, they are in, they are in pairs. Like Surah Al-Baqarah is talking to the Jews, Surah al is talking to the Christians. Okay. Uh, so the Saf is talking about organizing the Muslims and so the Jama'ah is talking about the ideological training of the Muslims. Uh, so the Mudassir and so the Muzammil, so the Fil and so the Quraysh, so the Falak, so the Nas, like this. You go on with the whole Quran, so the Rahman, so the Waqia. All these surahs are in pairs. Okay, all the surahs except for a few surahs in Quran are in pairs. And the pairing of Sutul Kahf is with Sutul Isra. And so this is one of the reasons you find, subhanAllah, Alhamdulillah. Now that you understand there's a link and Sutul Kahf is giving us an indication of certain things which we're going to look at. Now let's look at one of the aspects that is a common point of junction between the two surahs. Sutul Kahf and Sutul Isra. Okay. Now with this, this is uh, in some ways if you put the two surahs together this point coming together makes the a very, very strong, 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 strong point, which you'll see what that is. And it has to do with this war that is going on. And so let me go ahead and show you what that link is. Okay. In Sutul Kahaf, if you look, when Zulqarnain is dealing with yeah, Juj and Ma'juj. What is the words used for Ya'juj and Ma'juj? The words used for Ya'juj and Ma'juj is Inna Ya'juja wa Ma'juja mufsiduna fil ard. Indeed, Ya'juj and Ma'juj are causing fasad in the world. Okay, clear? And now look at the same word in Sutil Isra. Ayah number four. وَقَدَيْنَا إِلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ And we ordained it for Bani Israel fil kitab in the book لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ You will cause chaos in the world twice. وَلَتَعْلُنَّ عَلُوًّا كَبِيرًا You will cause chaos in the world twice with a big chaos. Okay. So we have in Surah Al-Kahf, the Mufsiduna, they will cause fasad in the earth. Okay? Mufsiduna fil ard. And over here, la tufsiduna fil ard. You will cause fasad in the earth or in the land. And over here again, inna ya'juja wa ma'juja mufsiduna fil ard. They will cause chaos in the earth. So mufsiduna fil ard. And then, Mufsiduna fil ard versus La tufsiduna fil ard. And you, Allah is talking to Bani Israel, and you will cause fasad in the world twice. The difference is that in Sutul Kahf, Allah is also giving us a location. So, and Sutul Bani Israel is not giving us a location, but giving us an idea of who they will be. What religion will they be? Who will they relate themselves to? Who will they associate themselves to be part of? They will associate themselves to be part of Bani Israel. They will associate themselves with the, Judeo, the, the Judaic religion. 
And somehow, some way, in some strange way, in some strange way, they will end up in this part of the world where Zulqarnain is in the Caucasus Mountains, which we're going to talk about a little bit. So fasad in the Caucasus Mountains, and a fasad that is led by people who claim to have a Jewish inheritance, okay, this is the sign of something of fasad in the world that would lead to those wars. But I'm not going to talk about those wars yet because I want to establish my points uh, very clearly, okay? So now, if anyone has any questions up to this point, because this point that I established between Sutul Kahf and Sutul Isra, and also I talked about Sutul Maryam talking about Christianity, and Sutul Isra talking about Bani Israel and Sutul Kahf in the middle, but also the relationship between Sutul Kahf and Sutul Bani Israel, and how they are, they have common themes throughout, and how they are linked together. And one of the things that links them together is this terminology that the two surahs use: "Mufsiduna fil ard" and "La tufsiduna fil ard." You will cause chaos in the world in Surah Bani Israel, and they are the cause. They are themselves fasad, uh, the the object of fasad in the world. Okay. And over here, Allah then tells us, Hal naj'al laka harajan ala naj'al baynana wa baynahum sadda. So over here, from here, we can now tell, uh, especially after these ayahs, uh, especially in ayah number uh, 96, and uh, uh, in the ayahs before that this is in a mountainous area. Okay, so now, let me see uh, if I can mute everyone okay so now before i move forward i hope that this link between stil kahaf and stil bani israel is in your mind so now if there's anybody that has a question about this link between la tufsiduna fil ard mufsiduna fil ard and stil kahaf and stil bani israel how they're interrelated with one another if anybody has any questions about this link then you can ask me otherwise then i'm going to go on to the next uh, point that I want to establish, inshallah. Okay, so inshallah, let's move on to the next point, which is, what is the facade in this area? Okay, so I want to just share that with you, especially at this time that we know uh, those of the things that we even know of. Okay. Um, I will talk about this in a second. Okay. This is the human rights organization. Okay. Talking about the problems that they've been causing in the area of Donbass, okay? And uh, the type of ethnic genocide, okay? Uh, are baseless. This article is saying that it's baseless, but it is not baseless. As we all know that a type of ethnic cleansing is happening in uh, this area in Ukraine uh, uh, with the Russians. And the Russians are not allowed to speak the Russian language. So, uh, so this is kind of like what's going on in Russia. Okay. And so this is one level of facade. And this is similar in a sense that, uh, as you'll see, I'll make this clear, inshallah. Okay. Um, let me see if I want to. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, for the longest time, the U.S. was saying, oh, uh, if you even look over here, I'll show you very quickly, inshallah, uh, uh, bio weapons in Ukraine. Look at the, uh, you know, these are the fact checking organizations, Russia's biological we weapons claims, Russia's false claims about biological weapons in Ukraine, theory about U.S. funded bio weapons labs in Ukraine, right? 
all you remember all of this when they were completely denying all of this. Now, uh, I'm sure you've all seen this clip, but in the context of these ayat in Sutul Kahf and Bani Israel, when you look at uh, this, let me show you now. Uh, I only have a minute left. Let me ask you, um, does Ukraine have chemical or biological weapons? Uh, Ukraine has uh, biological research facilities, which, in fact, we are now quite concerned Russian troops, Russian forces may be seeking to uh, gain control of. So we are working with the Ukrainians on how they can prevent any of those research materials from falling into the hands of uh, Russian forces should they approach. I'm sure you're aware that the Russian propaganda groups are already putting out there all kinds of information about how they've uncovered a plot by the Ukrainians to release biological weapons in the country and with NATO. So they continue their lives. But the point is, is that for the long time, they were saying there's no bioweapons labs. And now they've found several of these US funded labs where in Ukraine. Why Ukraine? Because Ukraine has a very strong see, you let me let me there's there's a few few reasons. Okay. Um, let me put it this way. Shaitan, so now we're we're talking not at the second level, now we're talking at the third level, how Shaitan works. Okay, this is how shaitan works. So we established the link between Stilkaf and Stil Bani Israel. We showed this is a place of facade where facade is now there in the world. They're not willing to accept themselves as a neutral zone. They are, uh, you know, having these uh, ambitions of these bio labs, whatever they are, which I'll talk about in a second. They are neo Nazis. They're racists. Okay, uh, of the highest order, and uh, so. That is happening at floor level one, the facade. Okay. But now I want to talk about floor number two, which is the things have how they are happening at the level of the shayateen, you can say. And that is that Shaitan did everything to disrupt from this area that Allah has pointed out in the Quran that, you know, Shaitan has knowledge from his experience being an alim. He has understanding of things and how Allah does things. Like for example, uh, when he was being kicked out, he said, give me time till the day of judgment. And he knew, you know, Allah will give it to him. So shaitan understands things. Shaitan understands human nature. Shaitan understands human history. Shaitan understands its own jinn's histories. So shaitan does things at a certain way. In it. And so like, for example, when these, these uh, before I, I talk about what shaitan does, let me actually mention this so that inshallah, it'll make more sense. Um, and that is that uh, the last, what is, what is the biggest problem that the Judeo-Christian civilization has with Russia? What is the biggest problem? What do you think is the biggest problem? I'll tell you what the biggest problem is. It is that they don't want a religiously identified state or empire, Christian or not Christian. That's what it means to be a secular state. When they talk about over and over again in the news, this will disrupt our international world order. If you remember the president, the Jewish president of Ukraine, he was saying this will disrupt the international world order. This will disrupt the international world order. If you remember him saying this. Why? Because if Russia takes over Ukraine and some of the aspects of Ukraine and undoes Ukraine, okay, and builds back that relationship with the church that, uh, that they want uh, with the Eastern Orthodox 
uh, Christianity, when, when Putin allows religion to become part of the state, this is essentially what's happening. When Putin allows religion to become part of the state, then it becomes a jawaz, a reason for what? For Muslims to have khilafah. And if the Christians establish their khilafah, if the Christians establish their religious state, it gives reasons for Muslims to also follow the that, oh, they established their religious state. We should establish our religious state, but not as a secular state, but as a religious state, not like Israel. Israel is a religious state, but on secular terms, compromising the completely Torah. You can have homosexual dance in Jerusalem and all of that. They don't care. OK, so you have the super religious with the super liberal. But Russia doesn't want that type of Christianity. Russia wants a Christianity that is uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, and it wants the secular state to merge with the church, to become a, a real empire with one religion, one political order, one religion, one language like this, you know, that kind of combines everybody and allows all the minorities, the Christians and the other groups, their freedom also, but then having this uh, Eastern Orthodox kind of like unity uh, amongst themselves. Their biggest problem, NATO's biggest problem is, is, is Russia is not okay. Yeah, I'm going to try to get him. And if somebody can try to get him for me, that would be great too. Uh, and, and, you know, since you mentioned Dugan, okay, since you mentioned him, let me uh, share with you an email. Oh, not email, sorry. Um, this thing that I emailed myself, really. Uh, let's see. Okay, so if you, uh, this is something that Dugan wrote, okay, the racist nature of unipolarity, of Western hegemony against the agents of influence, okay, at the level of geopolitics and geostrategy, Western racism is expressed in a uni, unipolar model. What does he mean by that? Uh, let me explain to you what he means. He says, that in the United Nations, you have the G7, the G20, you have the top, you have the caste system of nations. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want a caste system of nations. What China and Russia are both saying is we want every nation to literally be equal. That's one of the things that they're saying. But again, this is at level number, this is floor number one, because Shaitan is playing both sides in a sense, uh, which I mean, that's one of the things that I wanted to clarify here is that shaitan is playing both sides, meaning shaitan wins his way. He, he wants it both ways. If it, this wins, he still has his way. If this happens, he still has his way. But for the longest time, and this is what I wanted to make the first point with, that shaitan knew something about this region. And shaitan wanted to keep Muslims and the Orthodox Christians, who are the only two communities in the world who would have an empire that is on religious basis, that has a godly basis, okay? The only two communities in the world that would have an empire that in which the polit it is normative, it is normal for the politics uh, to be religious and the politics to have a religious bent, okay? These are the two, two only two empires. So, and there is something else that goes with this. So if, if Russia establishes itself as a, Eastern Orthodox Church that is not a secular state, but a religious state, then that uh, they would then Muslims would naturally lean towards that because why they would be they would have the same value system, rather than the global village of liberalism that we have today. So that's one point, but there's, there's, there's and so what does Shaitan do? Shaitan, for example, created communism took a group of Jews, especially from Ukraine, who brought down the Bolshevik revolution so that they would completely do away with religion, right? And who, what are the two biggest religions in this region? Islam and Christianity. And so they tried their best through communism to, you know, just wash away, wash away religion, 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 religion. Of course, that project failed because makaru wa makarullah wa Allahu khairul makirin. And they thought when Russia would come, USSR would come down, they were expecting the whole of Russia would break and everything would become into pieces. And there are so many resources, by the way, because if you look at Europe and Eurasia, 
you know, Western, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Western Europe doesn't have resources. It doesn't have copper and ti ti uh, titanium. It is the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea and this whole region of Russia that has all the oil where all the resources are. And what they were hoping for is Russia would break and then they would be able to make negotiations, bring in their companies, have these resources for themselves because they already occupied the Middle East and you know they already took everything away from all the areas that they colonized. They already had control of that. So how do you get more? So one of the ideas was let's get, let's break Russia up. So that's happening at the first floor. But at the second floor, the main, where the Shayatin are working, they're interested in one thing, promotion of liberalism and not letting any empire that has any religious, uh, you can say color, where politics and religion come together, not to let that come together. And now, and, and uh, okay, so now let, let's go let's go over here inshallah in a second and see uh, where where this takes us. Uh, let me actually uh, okay uh, show this to you. Now, what is very important is um, if, uh, let me also share this with you. Okay, uh, in ayah number fourteen, I've discussed this verses this verse of the Quran before, but I want to put it in a new context so that you have maybe a better uh, understanding of this. Eastern Orthodox Christians, because of this ayah, they would rather be friends with Muslims than be friends of their counterparts, the Protestants and the Catholics. You know, it's just like uh, in, in some ways, if you have some version of Islam, we see it sometimes as a bigger threat because it's easier to fool people, right? We see some version of Islam that's not real Islam, like say Qadiani, or Nation of Islam, we would see that in some ways as a bigger threat than uh, than something, someone being completely different because they're not pretending to be you, they're being themselves. So this verse of the Quran now tells us the attitude of Christians to one another. And then I'm gonna show you something that will reinforce this point as a very important point to understand what's happening so this is both at the divine level. So this is floor number one and two happening together, meaning Allah is intervening to make this happen. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, qalu inna nasara. And amongst those people who say we are Christians, right? We took a covenant from them and they forgot most of it. And we caused rust, or you can say uh, ill feelings towards one another. They were, they're angry with one another and they hate one another. This is, their, this is their destiny. Some group of Christians will hate another group of Christians and they will never have unity amongst themselves. Till the day of judgment, this will happen. Some Christians will be angry that, why did you accept Jesus? Some Christians will be angry, why did you make friendship with Muslims, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they will be divided amongst each other till the day of judgment. And then, now with this in mind, please uh, listen to... Um, this cheap American drone destroyed the billion-dollar drone industry. This powerful $99 drone. These men training on a football pitch in eastern Ukraine say they want to. No, I'll come back to this in a little bit. Let me see if it's this one. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. It has great, great might. Okay. We will. Uh, sorry about that. Let me see where I can get this particular. Hello, fellow students. Of uh, yeah, I will add this. This is a talk by a Jew on the selection of historically significant Ukrainian Jews. And this is very important to understand that this area where, we, where the world is fighting right now, Russia and Ukraine, is, has a strong Jewish history, has a very strong Jewish history. And uh, I don't have time to go into this right now. But let me see, there's one particular point I do want to share with you right now. And then maybe if I have time, then I can. Okay. 
I will talk about this in a little bit. Bismillah, somebody has been asking about uh, the relationship. Of... Um, Muhammad. Let me just kind of see if I can find it here. Um, Okay, let me just uh, bring it out over here. If you can please be patient for a second, and I will bring this out, inshallah, if Allah wills. Are caught up together, and there is a vile hatred for anybody who uh, thinks the kinds of things that exist in Russia could be remotely positive in any way. Uh, William Burns has tried to push back against that. He's tried to reason with people about it. It hasn't worked very well. But I think there was a chance for a short time. Now, Putin, from where he sits, looks at what's going on. He's aware of the things that we're discussing. But he also saw a large troop buildup in eastern Ukraine, uh, approximately 60,000 troops that were poised to strike at the Donbass, at Luhansk and Donetsk. And I think he was persuaded that this would happen and that obviously the Donetsk and Luhansk republics and their population would be destroyed. And he could not sit by and tolerate that. I also think he thought that there was no hope, that every time he tried to make the case, which he did several times, no one would listen to him. Somebody said, well, the reason this didn't happen under Donald Trump was that Donald Trump is strong and no one would challenge him. It had a lot less to do with that than Trump's private willingness to listen to Mr. Putin's position. What what disappointed Putin, and I think many others, was Donald Trump's inability to get... In fact, Donald Trump was probably not elected the second time because of uh, his understanding of Russians, uh, the, the position of the Russians. He was a lot more, you could say, sympathetic to that because he was following, you know, as a businessman, he was following logic. ...control of his own administration. He appointed people that were absolutely opposed to him and his thinking. So from the moment he opened his mouth and said, why can't we have a better relationship with Russia? He was sabotaged and subverted. Putin realized that. Then I think he waited to see how Biden would respond. And of course, you know that Biden was bragging about how he told uh, Putin that he was a vicious killer and a thug, how proud he was of insulting the man to his face and denigrating him and, and what he's done inside Russia. Uh, I think you put that together with the buildup in the East, and I think he felt Russia was genuinely, genuinely threatened, and he thought it was only a matter of time until something akin to the Pershing II missiles that we once had on the ground in Germany would show up in eastern Ukraine. And we can all sit here and say, oh, well, that wouldn't have happened. But he had a lot of reason to believe that it would, for the reasons we've already discussed, the NATOization of things. Uh, and that's the kind that, remember, the Pershing II was a hypersonic missile. You know, you're talking a few minutes and it lands in Moscow. And he kept telling people this. No one would listen. And there was no willingness to, to reassure him and his government in any way, shape, or form that this was not the intention. So I think he rightly concluded he didn't have much choice. And I think the biggest mistake that he's made, if he's made any with this operation, so I, th I think he's tried to be too careful. And I think it's tragic. But when you, when you do what he's done with his force, you try very hard to avoid unnecessary civilian casualties and avoid damage, you end up in the position he's in. This thing has lasted three weeks, longer than, than he would have liked. It creates opportunities for your enemies, for your opponents to, to meddle in, in what's happening. It gives false hope to people on the other side. That's the You'll see where when he starts, there's a part where he talks about Eastern Orthodox Christians, and that's where I want to take this. Problem. And that's what he's up against. And I'm sure he's heard that from his inner circle. I'm sure some of his senior officers have said that. And uh, if you try to convince anybody in the United States, by the way, that Vladimir Putin was remotely concerned about the loss of civilian life in Ukraine, well, they'll laugh you off the stage. That's impossible. He's evil. He's terrible. He's bad. It's a lot of nonsense. He was. And he still is, I think. I think he would like to get an agreement because I don't think he wants anything to do with going into Kiev. Kiev. Yeah. <laughs> That's the last option. I mean, if you look at it right now, uh, Kharkiv and Kiev are, are about it. The cauldron uh, has to be dealt with, and they're still laying siege to Mariupol. But I'm afraid, given the enemy that they have cornered there, the 3,000 Azov members, they're probably going to reduce it and be done with it. But that's clearly not what he wants in Kharkiv. That's clearly not what he wants in Kiev. But if he can't get somebody to put their name on the agreement and agree to those basic terms, then I suppose he's going to act. Well, let but me Russia ask has you. attacked Kharkiv. I mean, there were <laughs> a million buildings hit there. Yeah, the question is whether they will uh, actually go in and the, in the way they treat it, the way they did Grozny, for example. And yes, I think you're right, uh, Max. And that's the point, Aaron. 
if you go back to World War II, one of the first things that, that all sides learned in the war was that you don't win a city by going room to room and building to building to flush out your enemy. Doesn't work. You bring up artillery, you lower the guns and direct fire, and you bring down city blocks. That's what happened in Warsaw. It happened in Stalingrad. It happened all over Europe, all during the war. When we went into Manila, we did exactly the same thing. It was ferocious. Nobody wants to do that. It is the worst possible outcome. And that's why, for instance, as I was telling you earlier, I looked at some film footage this morning that came from Poland that was transmitted into Poland from Ukraine, showing Ukrainian citizens that had showed up at an exit point from Mariupol where the Russians said, come out, we have humanitarian assistance, in other words, food and, and medicines and so forth, and you will be protected. And sure enough, there was the Azov battalion. You're not leaving. You're not going anywhere. And the people, of course, were destroyed. But that's where we are. Yeah, I, I, we're seeing a lot of these sort of um, incidents at checkpoints of motorists being shot, particularly men. Uh, there may have been even some uh, Western journalists. Let's see if we can. Then Trump's private willingness to listen to Mr. Putin of how Biden responded and also Putin's decision to invade. Do you think that he had other options and strategically paranoia about our behavior? Uh, you mentioned the uh, missile sites down in Romania, for instance, and I had suggested on one occasion, in my judgment, very cavalierly, because we actually did have a long period of time where we had established a degree of mutual trust. That he had other options, and strategically, from a Russia kinds of things that exist in Russia could be remotely positive in any way. Uh, William Burns has tried to push back against that. He's tried to reason with people about it. It hasn't worked very well. But I think there was a chance for a short time. Now, Putin, from where he sits, looks at what's going on. He's aware of the things that we're discussing. But he also saw a large troop buildup in eastern Ukraine, approximately 60,000 troops that were poised to strike at the Donbass, at Luhansk and Donetsk. And I think he was persuaded that this would happen. And that's the kind that, remember, the Pershing II was a hypersonic missile. Now has better press than Mother Teresa. Uh, so he's reluctant to give that up. And I think Vladimir Zelensky has said publicly that Ukraine does not wish to join NATO. I guess my, my question is, do you think, I mean, you have sources all around the region. Do you think Zelensky even has the ability to negotiate given the different forces in Ukrainian politics, the hardline force? Biden is in a position that's not very different since Aaron Mate is interested in Vietnam. Uh, not very different from Lyndon Johnson in this sense. Uh, Lyndon Johnson wanted to end the war in Vietnam. In fact, there's a lot of session, maybe something worse. Well, uh, the longer this goes on, the, the harsher the outcome for us here at home. You know that Gasoline prices, like so many things, are lagging indicators. So the real problems have not even struck yet. So if you look at the prices of food, uh, energy, metals, these kinds of commodities, then add to that the enormous sovereign national debt that we have to service and the unambiguous requirement to increase interest rates and deal with inflation that is ostensibly dangerous to the economy. The question is, how long before we fall apart? How long before we, we simply can't go on? I mean, I'm always reminded of uh, the question that used to come up in graduate school and then subsequently when I was teaching, when did the British leave India? Well, the British did not leave India when they should have, when it made sense to do so, when it was strategically advisable. They left India when their debt to GDP ratio was 240% after World War II in 1947. That's when they left because they were broke. I suspect that we'll have something similar to that here in the United States. Uh, that will be a game changer. But all the expectations of imminent failure in Russia, I think, are, are ridiculous. I don't see any of that. And I think they'll stay the course. It's vital. It's a vital strategic interest for them. It isn't for us. It never has been. That's the problem. Well, Colonel Douglas McGregor, we're coming up on an hour. You're invited to stay with us. We have a. Uh, I, um, I couldn't find the part where he says clearly, and you can go to this. He says. They hate Eastern Orthodox Christianity. I mean, I was referring to that ayah. That's what I was trying to show. That the NATO, being Catholic and Protestant, they hate Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And so this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying uh, in this verse. Uh, let me bring this back. Uh, just, no. A I'm glad you reminded audience. me. I, I'm surprised my phone is.
سو من الذين قالوا انا نصارى اخذنا ميثاقهم فنسوا حظا مما ذكروا به فاغرينا بينهم العداوة والبغضاء so different christian groups are going to hate each other and when different christian groups hate each other as has happened throughout our history as muslims there has always been a group of christians who sided with the muslims over the other christian groups okay and this has happened many times in our history and it wouldn't be surprising if it happened in the long term in our own history now okay now let's go to because i have a lot still more to cover and i'm sorry that uh you know of my being disorganized you can say now let me go to another aspect of this uh which is which also plays a huge role which is how do the jews orthodox jews and the jews see russia how do they see russia okay so now here listen to this jewish rabbi and how they see russia in terms of their eschatology in terms of their end of times okay who do i think uh, we said we, we give this during during the, the 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 analyzing of the verses it seems i'm not i'm not signing so he, the question basically is who are the ones that will attack uh israel who is gog magog and so now he's going to give his answer on this it's don't don't take my words like if it will not be that it's actually very interesting because in the in in the passages of the of the 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 torah that he's reading that there is a direct address of allah to gog magog and of course he's going to say we're not gog magog right that's kind of obvious but uh you can read the verses of the bible from an islamic perspective and say you are being warned not to do this but anyway so what do what do the jewish people say who is gog magog okay now watch don't blame me but as a speculation it's very good probability that it's russia very good but i'm not i don't know it seems like this there are super well as we said it's a superpower it's in the north it says problem financial uh, economically all the reason it seems but you know what if tomorrow the eskimos will decide to change or switch with the russians they will be on the north so i don't know True, true. It doesn't really matter. So that's the Jewish eschatology. And then the uh, Christian eschatology is as follows. Interesting thing here. And hearing you say that, let's just dig into that a little bit more. You know, you've, you've got the majority of the world united, which never happens. It feels like you've got only five nations that are, including Russia, um, siding with Russia right, right now. Everybody else is, is looking at this and they're pretty horrified by it. Um, and so... When people say, because obviously when we talked about Gog and Magog, the belief that many have that Magog, Russia, would be the place where the Antichrist would come from, when people say to you, oh, it's got to be Putin, it's definitely Putin, um, and I know there are people who believe that, you would respond with what? Well, I would just say that Revelation 13, 1 says that the Antichrist will rise out of the sea, which many take that to mean the area around the Mediterranean Sea or the old Roman Empire. And so it's really more so a European origin than it is more of a Slavic or a Russian origin in that sense. And so I would place the Antichrist more among the Sea of Gentiles and the revived Roman Empire as opposed to the north. Uh, and of course, we know in Revelation 17, verse 15, it identifies the sea, that imagery of the sea as being the, those Gentile nations. So uh, that... By the way, Gentile nation means Muslims, okay? But uh, the part I wanted to show here is uh, how he identified uh, Gog Magog as Russia, okay? So the Antichrist is Muslims, okay? The Gentiles. And Gog Magog is Russia. So you see where the Christian, uh, the evangelical Christian attitude is going. To understand the topic, wanting to comment on the topic and... Doing great, Billy. Thanks for having me back on. Well, I wanted to have you on because we did an interview about Gog and Magog in Russia. And the interview sparked quite a bit of conversation. A lot of people... So you guys can go to this and check it out yourself. But my main point here is to... Established, number one, the facade in this region. Everything from the biolabs, and God knows what they wanted to do, 
And Allah knows that maybe they stopped everything with COVID because those bio labs were discovered or Russia took control of them and they just wanted their hands off or whatever. Allah knows best. But then the Jewish history in this area, which I'm going to still talk about, I haven't talked about, and, and I know time is running out, but I want to, let's see how far I can get in the next 15 minutes on that. Then at the eschatological level, both Christians and Jews, the, the Jews and the evangelical Christians, they agree that the problem is the Muslim world and Russia. And this has been their kind of like a way of thinking. And these are the people that are advising the presidents, by the way, you know, like uh, Jerry Fowell, uh, this uh, John Hagee was an advisor to uh, was an advisor to Bush uh, Jr. Uh, Jerry Fowell uh, was an advisor to uh, Reagan, for example. So these people are the ones that are advising these people on foreign policy and advising them. This is what the Bible says. And this is what the Bible says. And this is what the future is. And unfortunately, it seems like the, the Americans and the Europeans and more so America, because America is a very religious country compared to a lot of the European countries. But America takes into consideration these things with a serious consideration, especially because of Israel's friendship. So uh, let's look at what else we got here. Um, Yeah, I would go over this, but I don't think I have time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you uh, this other article or just a piece of it to kind of like. Uh, so this whole area where Ukraine is today uh, actually has been uh, documented to be called Khazar Sons of Megan. And this was a description by a Muslim of the Khazars uh, back in 70 AD. What is important here is, in fact, that the 70 in, that in 70 AD there was a bishop sent, uh, sorry, a bishop that was sent as a missionary messenger to the Khazars. The non-Christian Khazars were described in uh, Abu's Vita as the Khazars sons of Magog. Okay, uh, and they were Mongoloid. Uh, etc cetera, etc cetera, blood eating savages and so on and so forth there's a lot that uh that has been written on the khazars including uh you can say from the uh jewish virtual encyclopedia and the fall of the khazars um and again the, the these are all uh, this the, this area of kiev is where ukraine is so this is where these jews were and they have a very strong history in that land um, this is another very excellent article that talks about great walls in the area. So I'll just read this one sentence to kind of give you an idea. Far less known is similar great walls that were built across Eurasia. China was not alone as a victim of nomadic uh, predation. Steppe land stretch from the frontiers of China in the east to Ukraine in the west, etc., etc. The Caucasus region functions as a land bridge that connects Eurasian steppes with Persia, Middle East, and the South, et cetera, et cetera. So they also, okay, uh, built uh, a lot of the walls. There was more than one wall, by the way. There's many great walls. And let me see if I can bring this up here. Uh, Darbant. Uh, here. The nomadic, okay, so... This is where really the, uh, the walls are, the Darbant Pass and the Darial Pass, right? These are the most two likely places where the walls are, okay? And uh, this uh, is uh, one of those places where the walls were. There was, there's a wall over here, there's a wall over here, there's a wall on the other side of the Caspian Sea called the Gorgon Wall. Um, so there were a lot of these walls trying to keep these people who later on became of the Jewish religion. Right. So these Khazari Jews became and the, this is where Ukraine is today. And this is what Sultan Kahf is pointing to. And uh, the, Sultan Kahf is basically saying, look at the walls in history. Where are they? Where are the walls in history? And look north of that. And uh, if you look at the walls in this uh, region, north of that is basically trying is, is pointing towards, of course, part of Russia, but then 
a big portion of Ukraine and this whole area under uh, by the Caucasus Mountains. Okay. Uh, now, let's continue, inshallah, and then I will end uh, very, very quickly. Um, uh, of course, Zelensky suggests Jerusalem host in negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. Um, again, trying to establish a, a relationship. Uh, let's see if I can move forward uh, on this. Uh, story of medieval European Jewish state, the Khazari. This is where Ukraine is today. And uh, who are the Khazars? This is also a very interesting read, by the way. Um, okay, so this was the other big thing I wanted to say. Russia joins Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution Network. It doesn't matter to Shaitan who is the leader as long as things are moving in a certain trajectory. So even if Russia wins, even if Russia gets rid of the dollar, but as long as things are moving in a certain direction, Shaitan still has a strong influence on the overall flow of things. And one of the things, Russia or not, they have no choice. Think of it willingly or unwillingly, wanting it or not wanting it. Russia is part of the fourth industrial uh, re revolution, Russia is part of the Great Reset. There's no running away from that. So if the dollar becomes weaker, or if America falls because it's in debt, like this gentleman was saying before, that doesn't hurt the plans of Shaitan. That actually helps the plans of Shaitan. That still makes Israel rise, okay? Um, that still makes... Israel rise. And that's the ultimate goal. Whoever wins or loses is secondary. The main thing is that how Shaitan plays both sides or all sides to make Israel become the world power. That's what uh, our eyes need to be on at the, at the level of the second floor. So it's great if Russia defeats liberalism. That's a defeat for Shaitan. But at the same time, it doesn't mean you got rid of the whole problem. A lot of the problem will still remain. Things will go from paper money into digital currency. So Shaitan still has a lot of leeway on how he will use this situation to his advantage. Yes, it will be a big hit to liberalism. And I believe what Shaitan will do is say, okay, and, and as you see, if you read the ahadith of end times, now this is like one of the main points I wanted to make that we have to keep in mind. If you read the ahadith of end times, what's one of the things you find? It's a very religious world. So the world will become religious again. And Shaitan will actually use that to bring back the Messiah. So the Shaitan wants to bring back religion because now the Jal has to come as the Messiah. In order for people to take Messiah seriously or any concept of Messiah seriously, you have to have a religious world. No one's going to take Messiah seriously in a world that what? In a world that religion's not taken seriously. So secularism has to fall. Nation states have to fall because they're two are interlinked, okay? And religion has to rise. And so, so even though something good is happening with Russia and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, mu'minun," even the believers will rejoice on that day, right? Uh, so if America wins and NATO wins, for example, which will most likely not happen as I will end with something you'll find interesting. If America wins, they're fine. They continue to erode this economy until it completely falls and everything falls with it. If they lose, they're still fine because religious people are going to be like, see, our prophecies are being true. See, all the Jews are going back to Israel. See the rise of Russia. So now their eschatology is changed in such a way, okay, that it opposes them completely against us. What Quran is telling us to do, get close to Russia or Eastern Orthodox Christianity, get close to them and establish your khilafah, establish your deen and have a relationship with them and oppose this godless society, right? When we do that, they will see in their Bible, oh, see, we are on the right and they are on the wrong. They're the Antichrist. They're the Gog and Magog. 
not realizing who's re the real Gog and Magog. This is something that the Jews have a very hard time coming to grips with. And one day I will go into more details about this in, in much greater detail, inshallah. But over here, I'm just showing you that how things are happening at different levels. At the level of the reset, it doesn't make a difference. But if liberalism dies, then you can bring in a religious world that then allows the Messiah to come and people will actually anticipate the Messiah to come more. People will want the Messiah to come more. And so shaitan's happy to give them a, relig a religious view as long as it's not the correct religion. And so he accomplished through secularism what he wanted because secularism was absolutely necessary for the rise of a certain group of people of Bani Israel. Because as long as there is no secular world, then the majority will always have the upper hand. So the Christians have an upper hand in Christian lands. Muslims have an upper hand in the Muslim lands. And the Jewish, Jewish Jews will always be a minority. But when you bring secularism, where you throw religion out the door, where you bring in liberalism, you make us into animals, right? Religion doesn't matter. Then you can play any agenda against religion or towards the work of shaitan any way you want. Now that that will be accomplished more and more, or when shaitan sees and the Dajjal sees, oh, there's an alliance between Muslims and the Christians now that I was trying to stop being developed. So now I have to to make sure that those people that are on my side, they get stronger. So the point being at the floor number, at floor one, things are happening good, okay? If, especially if Russia wins. But floor two, at the level of Christian and Jewish eschatology, at the level of the Great Reset, you're still running into problems. Okay, now uh, I want to end by uh, showing you this, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Um, oh, okay, yeah. This is a good picture to kind of show as far as liberalism is concerned, what is going on, okay? So you have, you know, the, the rainbow people, right? And you got the US and you got the Nazis and then you got the Eastern Orthodox Christ Christians under the umbrella. So they, they're like protecting themselves from all these onslaughts. Okay. And that's a good thing. Okay. So that part is the good part. Now, uh, let me share with you the next, the last thing that I want to share with you for now. Um, And, and uh, the language here will not be very clean. Obviously, army people don't speak very clean languages. But this is to give you an idea of, of the verses, perhaps, of the Quran are coming very true uh, very quickly, as you'll see in, in a second. I'm going to share with you something. Is this your Telegram group or what? This is my Telegram group, yes. Uh, well, no, this okay. is not my, this is another Telegram group, but I do have a Telegram group. Yes. Okay. Are uh, there any, can we join this group or? Yeah, I'm sure anybody can join. Uh, but okay. I want to share with you. Okay. So, uh, yes, there is dirty language here. So, but it makes the point I'm trying to make, inshallah, very quickly. And that has to do with, before I actually talk about this, let me uh, share with you the verse of the Quran that I want to focus on uh, for this. And that is. The Byzantines have been defeated in a, in a land nearby. And after their defeat, they will be the ones victorious. In three to nine years. For Allah is the affair from before. And this is the main word here. And after. What is Allah referring to after? 
meaning before in the time of the prophet and after, after the time of the prophet. This is one interpretation. There can be more than one interpretation for this. Min qablu means the first time when they lost. Min ba'du, the next time when they win. It can also mean that. But if you're not looking, if you're reading just re reading Quran and looking at the words of Quran, it seems to indicate more what? Seems to indicate more that it is referring to the future. Why? The proof of that is in ayah number five. Nasrullah, with the help of Allah, yansuru man yasha. Yansuru is future tense. And he will help whoever he wills, meaning in the future. Wahul Aziz al Rahim, and he is Al Aziz, he's the one who has authority, and he is the most merciful. Wa'adullah, the promise of Allah. La yukhlifu again, future present tense. La yukhlifu Allahu wa'ada. Walakin aksara nasi la ya'lamun. But most people will not know that meaning in the future, will not get it, will not understand that in the future. Okay? And so Allah is saying that in the future you will have a victory. Now, about that victory now, I want to share with you what these two people, they say about what's happening on the ground, the ground realities of the situation. And this is what I also wanted to talk about, that this is very, very dangerous, what this person said. So for any of you who are... This is an American. So it's not just Ukrainians fighting anymore. This person is suggesting they already have troops from all over the world fighting in Ukraine. And you know how this propaganda machine, the Jewish propaganda machine has been working day and night to help Ukraine. So now listen to what this person says. We're wondering what is going on. All right. We were part of the Georgian National Legion, the 102nd Ukrainian territory. So for any of you who are wondering what is going on. All right. We were part of the Georgian National Legion, the 102nd Ukrainian Territorial Defense. Okay. Our base got fucked up. The base right next to us got fucked up. Americans, British, tons of British dead. All right, they're not saying nothing. They're counting our dead as their dead. They're trying to send us to Kiev with no fucking weapons, no kit, no fucking plates. The people who are lucky enough to get weapons are only getting magazines with like 10 fucking rounds, okay? When they wanted to send us to Kiev, we said no. Our whole group, a bunch of Americans, Canadians, British, so they told us we had to get the fuck out or they were going to shoot us in the back, all right? So me, this British guy, and another American, we fucking hid in the back of an ambulance to get out. We, we got to the border, and it, it was a whole nother mess. When you get to the border, anyone who has kit, anyone who has any military shit, they're fucking pulling you out of the line, and they're sending you back to the front. This human, we got dropped off about five clicks from the fucking... Uh, from the border and we walked um and we get to the border in this humanitarian group with a bunch of ex-SF veterans from England uh pull us to the side and say you need to get like pulled us out and fucking like hit us and they were like you need to dump all your kit they're pulling people out cutting up passports sending them back so we dumped our shit we got like in all of our fucking we got in like red cross vests and they had like fucking humanitarian passes to get us through the ukrainian border people need to stop coming here it's a trap and they're not letting you fucking leave the best way to leave is like in a vic or a car or something people who get on by vehicle have a better chance of hiding their fucking kit in the back doing whatever the fuck they can but do not try to leave ukraine on foot if you're a volunteer it's a mess and it's it, it's a trap and I have multiple people who can confirm this story for me I'm getting okay so this is one I wanted to show you and then another one I want to share it with you is to give you an idea of the type of like bringing people from the world like they really brought people from around the world you know uh And of course, anything that is pro-Russia in any of this, this is another guy. Uh, I'll just read to you what he says. A video of a Brazilian mercenary in Ukraine 
was filmed in a car heading for Poland. He said, I don't know what to say. Special forces from all over the world, from France, all over Europe, from South Korea, Chile, America, Canada, guys, the whole world is there. There are special forces from all over the world. And then every, and then, and then very simply, all I know is that they're all dead. They are all destroyed. You can't understand one thing. You, it, you just can't understand one thing, how the plane shoots missiles at you. You can't understand. It's all over. It's all over. The whole part is destroyed. And then I have other videos also uh, of actually showing when these shootings are going on in the bases that Russia completely destroyed. And people are walking away filming it, you know. Um, so the point being that uh, th this is why this chaos can become catastrophe. is because the world is desperate to bring down Russia by hook or by crook. But they don't want to do it at the cost of their own lives, which would be a nuclear war. But they're, they're willing to do everything else, everything short of that they're willing to do to bring Russia down and to, uh, you know, they, they've used the, 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 the misinformation machine that they have. And uh, it, it seems for some reason, I don't know what it is, but it seems like they're really going all out, uh, putting in an, an enormous amount of effort to bring Russia down. I mean, it's just unthinkable to like, you know, bring in all these military people, mercenaries, you know, mercenaries from around the world to fight the Russians. And it does seem that uh, even though Russia got stuck in the middle early on because uh, they didn't bring the element of surprise, they kind of like stood by the border and then slowly went in. You can't bring in everybody at once anyway, because the, your roads would be blocked. These are small roads. You can only send so many people at one time. So the element of surprise wasn't there. The uh, Ukrainians had an advantage because of that and uh, delayed some things. It created problems for the Russian army. But the point is that uh, in the end, it seems now it's, it would be generally coming to an end. But we'll see because they're so desperate to prolong this war and of course, if the war is prolonged and sending people more and more, in the end, it hurts the dollar. It hurts the, the, just the whole economy, right? So even though it is a very good thing what is happening between Russia and Ukraine, it is a very good thing that uh, the liberal uh, aspect of the world is being hit hard by uh, a, another world, the Eastern Orthodox Church that has uh, you can say ambitions to create a new religious world. Okay. Uh, but uh, no matter what side wins, we still have a long way to go as an ummah. So this is one of the things I wanted to clarify is that, yeah, it's great what's happening because anything that hurts uh, the, the godless uh, civilization is a good thing for us. Uh, but you can also see how desperate they are and how far they're willing to go to preserve what they have. And so what I want, I'm trying to understand this, that why are they so desperate? Is it because of the biological weapons that, that have been discovered they're that desperate? And by the way, uh, I think it is almost confirmed. Uh, I can't say 100%, but from what I was looking at, it's almost confirmed that part of the, the research was on bats. And so, you know, that relates directly with Corona. And so if it comes out, of course, that the U.S. was funding these, uh, these labs uh, that were doing this type of research raises a big question mark. And, you know, Russia has been trying to promote this and try to bring, uh, I think there was recently a conference in which they agreed, yes, we need to look into this in the United Nations or whatever uh, diplomatic steps uh, Russia is taking on the bio labs. But the point being, this is an area of facade and heavy facade. And so you can expect things not to go necessarily as planned, but you can expect that uh, they will do their best to their, whether that's today or one week or two weeks, but they will do their best to create facade in that area and to, to bring about 
as much facade as possible. I'm just surprised that, you know, you have, uh, when you look at the other videos, it becomes more surprising that you have so many people from so many parts of the world just being brought to Ukraine to fight. And I'm just wondering, does it have to do with the bio labs or does it have to do with uh, the history or something to do with the histories of the Jews in the area? Uh, uh, let me just... Uh, Let me show this to you. Uh, um, so let me the just Jewish end history. with this. As we all watch the terrible events that are currently unfolding in Ukraine, I think it's important for us to recall that Jews have a very, very long and rich history in this region. And I've prepared a couple of videos already that point to the long Jewish history there. Today, what I'd like to do is to just give you a few biographical snippets of some historically significant Jews who have come from Ukraine. This video could be much longer than it actually is because there are literally hundreds, maybe thousands. Uh, the reason I'm showing this is so maybe somebody can do research and help me out to maybe point to something in this area that was the Khazari Jews and then the Khazari Jews were destroyed and it seemed like they went to the west of Europe. And, but still there are significant amount of Jews in this area. The president and the vice president are both Jews. And thousands of really famous Jews who have come from Ukraine themselves or are of Ukrainian Jewish lineage. By the way, please don't write in the comment box, why didn't you include so-and-so? Why didn't you include this person? Cause that's just gonna make me feel guilty. I mean, there are literally hundreds of people that could have been included in this video. I just picked a handful that were really meaningful to me in particular. Some people are kind of surprised that I would portray life for Jews in Ukraine as anything except unrelenting suffering. And you know, I I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the reality is that for the vast majority of the time that the Jews lived in Ukraine, they lived in a cultural symbiosis with their neighbors. Uh, sometimes there was more strain. And sometimes in fact, there was even you know, peasant uprisings that resulted in Jewish deaths. That's hand of Ukrainian antagonists, uh, but there's also, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of relatively peaceful coexistence, as I've discussed in previous videos. I think it's hard for people to let go of that kind of reified mindset with regards to the experience of Jews in Ukraine. I'm certainly not giving Ukrainian history a free pass here. I think I know more than most people about the violence that was perpetrated against Jews in 1648, 1768, 1919, and of course in the Holocaust. However, when you look at the overarching amount of history that Jews have spent in Ukraine, it, it's easy to, you know, lose sight of the, the more quiet moments that dominated that long history. And by the way, some people say, well, you know, what about Nazis in Ukraine? And they'll point to tiny examples sometimes more significant obviously during the holocaust of ukrainians who supported more right-wing causes it's a silly argument you look and it is those same nazis that now the jews are supporting in that same country right now at america we've got nazis here in the united states we've got nazis in virtually every country of the world they tend to be tiny little fragments of the population they tend to represent kind of like the QAnon uh, supporting individuals who may band together and rant at passers-by and things like that we certainly don't condemn an entire society because of these tiny minorities especially when that society has demonstrably taken steps to quell that kind of activity which is not something that even america has done very well at any rate i want to focus here on ukraine let's have a look at some of the significant jews that have lived in this region here's a map just to recall what we're talking about when we say ukraine these are the contemporary political boundaries although it's important to note that with the exception of a couple of points in this long history, Ukraine was not a titular nationality. I mean, they didn't have their own state that they could claim this is our boundaries of our country and so on. Ukraine was typically dominated by other countries and the ethno-linguistic population known today as Ukrainians often found themselves within, let's say, Poland or Russia in particular. Also, sometimes they were divided, meaning the Western sections in particular found themselves under the Austrians or the Hungarians or the Poles and the Western group found themselves under the Russians, for example. If we go to the earliest point in Ukrainian history where we actually have named Jews, uh, the 12th century stands out because there are two figures who belong to the Talmudic school of the Tosafists. Uh, these are very, very important thinkers who, um, you know, circulated uh, commentaries on the Talmud in particular. One is named Moshe of Kiev. He maintained correspondence with Rabbeinu Tam, one of the most famous of this school of scholars. Also correspondence with Gaon Shmuel Ben Ali of Baghdad. And there's another Isaac of Chernihiv, sometimes uh, recorded as Isaac of, or Yitzchak of Chernigov. That would be the Russian pronunciation of the same place. Also a 12th century figure who traveled to the West, to the Rhineland, and he became one of the students of Rabbi Yehuda Hechassid during the period of the Hasidic Ashkenaz. Um, here's what Ukraine looked like at that time. This is the period of Kiev and Rus, where it was centered in Kiev, which is sort of in the center of this map here, but extended really quite far north as well. There are many, many more famous Jewish names when you get to the 18th century in particular. That's because Ukraine has been absorbing over the following centuries, um, hundreds and hundreds of Jews moving to Ukraine for reasons we discussed in a previous video, but briefly, uh, anti-Semitic pressures from the West driving them out and economic possibilities in the East drawing them in. And they live at this time under the auspices of the Polish-Lithuanian government, Polish lithuanian Commonwealth. Here is what that massive state looked like in 1764. Uh, the uh, Ukrainian part of it is sort of like the, the bottom section of the yellow map. You can see there that Kiev is just outside of it in the, the green part, which would have been part of Russia proper. Russian uh, Jews, by the way, were barred from living in Russia from 1479 on. So uh, all the Jews who are making their way to the east are kind of piling up in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and many of them are settling in the southern half, which is represented by this yellow section. It is in this area that the Hasidic movement... Oh, which reminds me, now that he said that, there are writings about how Russians 
when the czars were there, not the Soviet Union, but before the Soviet Union, how Russians didn't want Jews in Russia. Uh, they, they, they abhorred the Jews. Uh, they didn't like the Jews. And, and I'll show you some literature about that at another time because we're running out of time. But just wanted to simply share that uh, Israel sees uh, Russia as Gog Magog and Jews don't particularly really like, I mean, or Eastern Orthodox Christianity doesn't particularly like uh, the Jews. And that leads me to one of my last points, which is that, uh, of course, now you can see when the world wants to do something, they can have every TV advertisement talking about Ukraine, donate to Ukraine, help Ukraine. And then when it comes to Yemen or Iraq or Palestine, nothing, silence. They don't want to do anything. You see, when there's a will, you can see now how the world functions. And when there's no will, right, there's, there's just complete, uh, like, the hey with you, who cares about you, how the world reacts. And so, um, I mean, yeah, it is hypocrisy at the finest. But over here, one good thing about the Eastern Orthodox uh, Church, they're freeing and helping the people of Donbass is very similar to as if we help the people of Palestine. They're helping them from the ethnic genocide and we have to help the Muslims in Kashmir and Palestine and other places with the same. So there's this kind of like, a, uh, also this is also a common point between the two. But like I said, at the, fir at the first level, at the, you know, the ground floor, what is happening is good because it's happening against liberalism. And that helps us as a civilization regardless. But at the, at the second floor and the third floor, we still have the problem of the Great Reset. Uh, we still have the problem of eschatology, Jewish eschatology and Christian eschatology, pointing fingers on Muslims and Russia, which again brings us closer in a sense, because, you know, Ali radiallahu anh, he said there are three types of friends. One is like your true friend, like your best friend, right? You have a best friend, you share everything with them. And the other is the person you trust. He's not like your best friend. You just, you know, you just trust him. So th the best friend is different from the person you trust. You trust this person with uh, your secret or your money or something. You know he's a good person. You can trust him, okay? And uh, the third type of friend is the one who has the same enemy as you. So this is kind of like the type of mawadda or friendship that we have. It's, it's probably somewhere between two and three, right? It's not like your real brothers, like the Muslim brothers. But it's somebody you can trust more than definitely the, the, the West. And uh, if not that, then at least for a while, we have a common uh, antagonistic uh, entity um, in, in the name of Judeo-Christian civilization, which is basically secular. Because when Christians and Jews come together, that's like an impossibility. You have one religion that killed the god of another religion. And the only way they can ever come together is through the idea of secularism. Right. And so, um, OK. Uh, yeah. And so that's the Ya'juj yeah, Ma'juj civilization, uh, you know, that they, their people. And Ya'juj yeah, and Ma'juj is not just really, uh, only a genetic people, but it is a civilization. It is a people who follow a certain way, you know. Uh, a man is on the religion of his friend, like that. And so unfortunately, Muslims don't understand uh, what is happening. But I wanted to present to all of you kind of like a bigger picture of the positives and the negatives of both what is happening, how it relates to Quran, particularly Sutul Kahf and Sutul Isra, on the facade of Bani Israel versus the facade of Ya'juj and Ma'juj coming together as to make one statement that I showed in the very beginning. And then how Christian groups will be in different groups. And because of that, some will be closer to us, some will be farther for us. If they hate one another, then like I said, the, uh, the, the, your enemy and his enemy, if I have an enemy and somebody else has an enemy, if we have the same enemy, then we'll be closer together. And so this is kind of like the phenomenon that is taking place. And so we will uh, end up probably having, but then at the higher level, what? At the higher level, shaitan has it planned out on both ways, right? To move society, just because the dollar goes down doesn't mean that the whole system will be replaced by khilafah. That's our job to do, 
That's our responsibility to do. But what it does do, I hope, really, that the Muslims now begin to see that, wait, at, at least at the political level, Muslims get to see that, uh, you know, that they control everything, everything from your food to your supply lines to your, they can do sanctions on your money, they can do sanctions on, 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 on what, you, what comes to you inside your country, goes out of your country, they can pull things out to hurt you. Uh, and so um, this is where we are. And I hope that uh, this was beneficial, inshallah, jazakumullah khairan. Sheikh, I had a question. Uh, yes. If you, uh, so I had a question. Yeah, we know the, um, the big politics and how this thing's going to play out. But at the same time, you have that feeling, like we know that they're being hypocritical. But uh, as a Muslim, you still have that feeling that still that uh, innocent mothers and kids are dying. So you cannot just be like, oh, here we go. This is like something positive. But at the same time, how do you deal with the other side of dealing with the people who are dying on the ground? <laughs> Like, how do you take that and <laughs> like, how should we deal with that? So number one, no one dies without the permission of Allah, right? Yeah. Okay. Number two, uh, the Byzantine Empire was fighting with the Persian Empire. And the Byzantine Empire is not an innocent empire. They did a lot of sins, you know, a lot of crimes. And this is why the Quran gives us a principle. Al fitna tu akbaru min al qatl. Fitna, chaos and corruption, where people are confused what's right, what's wrong. A situation of bewilderment, a situation of chaos, a situation where you can't tell what's right, what's wrong, like liberalism, is worse than murder. Chaos, anarchy, sexual anarchy, moral anarchy. Men, human beings being reduced to animals is worse than killing. So even though it's bad, killing anybody is bad. Every human being, if you have a good heart, any human being will feel bad that people died. That's why, what? Wars should not be done unless absolutely necessary. But here's the reality that the Quran teaches us. Christian or whatever it is. The prophet didn't want wars. But once you go to the war, once you press that button, then you have to become hard and strong and unrelenting and not giving up. And you got to keep moving till you win, right? Once that button's pressed, but you don't want to press that button until you have absolutely no choice. So from that perspective, who's killing who? Meaning, uh, did Russia have a choice with m missiles possibly coming at its borders? then if you left the other people no choice, then who is to blame? It is the Ukrainians that are to blame for the deaths that even Russia does because they put their own civilians. And what do these uh, Jewish people care about what happens to these Christians that are fighting? They don't care. They're the ones to blame. I mean, it would be very easy for Ukraine to say, look, you know, we'll become a neutral zone. We're not going to bring, we're not going to become part of NATO. That's all it would take. Uh, for Putin not to be able to go in and to lose his moral uh, strength to go in, right? Um, and so uh, I, at least in this war, in this context, uh, would put the whole blame on the Ukrainian government for not relenting, you know, because what did Ukraine think? That the whole, you know, America will jump in and create a no-fly zone over Ukraine? America always breaks its promises. It didn't do any of that. And so now, because he doesn't want to lose his job as a president, he used to be a comedian. Yesterday, somebody was showing me some of his uh, singing clips or something that he had, or I don't know, something really like gross that he was doing on TV. And uh, now he has a job as a president and he doesn't want to give up and he wants to put people in harm's way. And, and, and it seems like he's being supported specifically from Israel, because if you notice the news, Israel's chancellor met, uh, sorry, German's chancellor met Israel, and they took a 180 degree turn and started supporting Ukraine. Just a few days ago, uh, Israel and Turkey had talks. And now you'll see slowly, Turkey also is going to begin to change its mode of conversation regarding this whole situation. And so Allah knows best. But the biggest thing for me and you is this, is that what the Quran said is coming true. And what the Quran pointed to is true. 
the area Quran pointed to is true. The, the divisions between the Christian groups is true. The possibility and more, in, I mean, with the Chechnyans, it's already happened, but the, with the this very strong possibility of an alliance between Muslims and Christians in this region is very true. And that Allah will help them. This is also coming true. So this is a solace for us that we need to, at one level, yeah, it's, it's important to know what's happening politically. But it's more important that you have your own tazkiyah, you have your own jama'ah, you have your own hijrah plans, you have your own uh, plans of what you're going to do when this whole system falls. And that's like kind of like uh, the end goal of all of this war is that this, this is showing you that what Allah said, that I'm going to destroy every city, is coming true. That we're headed in that direction, right? And people want, and this is the interesting thing, if you look at the language of the Biden and, the, and all the NATO people, it's like they want it. They want it. And, and part, partly, partly not mostly, but partly, the reason is because they want to be, you know, God's hands on earth. They want to bring about these changes so that Jesus will come back or the Messiah will come back or whatever their delusions are that will come back. And so Shaitan knew that the biggest enemy in the end times will be the Orthodox Christians and Muslims. And so that's what he's put in the Bible of the Christians and the Jews, that they're the Antichrist and they're the ones to blame. And so one of the jobs we need to do now is to go back to that same Bible and to prove them wrong based upon their own books and say, see, this is not what the Bible is really saying. The Bible is saying, like, for example, one of the things I noticed is that uh, in the Bible, God is talking to Gog and Magog directly. And the people he's talking to, they're in Israel. So anyway, this is something that we need research on and to create dialogue with the Jews, with the Christians, with the fellow Christians that no, this is not the real eschatology. The real eschatology is this. And so that's also a work that needs to be done. And, and you know, somebody needs to specialize in that field. Thank you, Sheikh. Really appreciate it. And can you also, uh, I have a request, can you also make a video with uh, Dr. Omar too? regarding yeah, this situation i will try to do that inshallah i will try to jazakallah really appreciate your help and support okay jazakallah khair assalamu alaikum